Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very, very much for coming. We have a lovely guest today, John, one of the nicer people in the campus. So I met John like one and a half years ago in India, and from then I tried to convince him to come yeah. all the way from the electrical engineering to spray to give a talk. <coughs> Finally, it's happened. Uh, so John, most of his education is from the UK, um, did a PhD there and then worked as a senior lecturer uh, in Scotland. And then in 2010 decided that uh, the beach and the sun in Sydney is much better, so moved here to UNSW. He's professor at electrical engineering. Uh, wide range of interest and in all of them he's doing very, very well. And I thought that it would be great to have him here to chat a bit about what he's doing. So there's a lot of overlap with what we want to do, or what PV needs to do. So, John, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Ziv. Um, please thank welcome you. him. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ziv. Um, it's a long time since I've been called lovely, <laughs> but I, I appreciate those words. Um, so, yes, my, my background's in electrical engineering. Uh, I started life as an academic researching electrical machines and how we control electrical machines using power, power electronics, inverters, that type of thing. And of course, that's become uh, a, a really significant part of how we connect and how we will continue to connect renewables to the grid. Uh, and that's partly what I am here to talk about. Just about that. OK. So most of what I'm talking about is to do with an arena grant that we're currently executing here at UNSW in conjunction with uh, AEMO, the market operator, TAS Networks, and Electronet. And it's really looking at the performance of inverter-connected renewables, and in particular, some of the unusual behaviors that can happen with inverters, particularly their control systems, um, to grid disturbances on the network. And by a disturbance, it can be anything from a relatively benign dip in voltage to some quite extreme faults. And what we found is in the, um, the, the inverters that we're testing, which are mainly rooftop inverters, um, about half of them misbehave in one way or another. Um, so what I'll do is I'll spend the first part of the seminar talking a little bit about what an inverter is and in particular the control system, and then we'll look at some of the testing that we've done here at UNSW on a set of inverters. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to shout them out. Um, if I get too many questions and I'm not gonna get through the seminar, I'll ask you to leave your questions till the end so that we can get through in a timely fashion. So, what does this talk about? The, there is currently about seven gigawatts of residential-based inverters connected to the network here in Australia. That's around about two million systems, um, somewhere between two and five kVA each. Okay, so that's the portfolio of unmanaged generation connected to our network, and it's becoming quite a significant portion of the capacity of the network, maybe not so much the energy that's delivered, but certainly the capacity. So in the NEM, we have a peak demand of about 40 gigawatts. Um, so there are times when some particular states can be operating almost entirely off power generated and delivered through inverter connections. The inverters are regulated through standards, and the current standard in force in Australia is AS4777-2015, um, so it was revised um, early, earlier in this decade. And we also have inverters that are connected to our network, which are 2005 compliant. So already we have a portfolio of inverters that are satisfying two different standards depending on when they were installed. And some of the work I'm reporting today is um, informing another revision of AS4777, um, which we hope will be 2020, but it may drag on a little bit. Uh, and some of, the, some of the changes 
that are happening to the standard are because of the unusual behaviours that we're now seeing. So we're tightening up on some aspects <coughs> of the standard and we're introducing new, new types of tests. All the test data that I'm showing you today are on inverters which are compliant with the standard tests. Um, so we're not arguing that they are not compliant, but it's partly the way the compliance tests are configured which is leading to these uncertain behaviours. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I go through the results. So there are portfolios of small-scale inverters um, that now represent upwards of 200 megawatts for a particular make and model. Um, so if a particular make and model is popular and it is vulnerable to disconnection with certain types of disturbances, that can become an issue for the market operator um, because they have to be able to manage the demand and the supply of real power in the network. So how vulnerable inverters are to disconnections and containments is becoming a particular issue and obviously becoming of increasing importance as we intend to connect more and more inverter connected generation to our network. So um, how many of you know how an inverter works? Okay, maybe half of you. So it's probably worth explaining the, the basic concept. Um, this is one example of a grid connecting system. The inverter, which is the power electronics, is in this block here. And typically that takes a standard form of a H-bridge if it's single phase or a six switch inverter if it's a three phase system that you're connecting to. Now the power electronics is switched usually using a technique called pulse width modulation where you switch the devices at a very high frequency compared to the grid so upwards of 10 kilohertz 10,000 times a second and you modulate the, the width of the pulses in order to synthesize on average a sine wave at 50 hertz at the required voltage. So pulse width modulation is a very common technique in power electronics and it's very powerful because you're literally just turning the switches on or off which means the devices run at a very high efficiency so we have virtually no losses in the inverter uh, and we can modulate the, the magnitude of the sine wave we produce, we can modulate the frequency and we can change the phase and that's what we have to do in order to connect our renewable source which generally is DC or a variable AC system to the grid at the correct voltage, the correct frequency and the correct phase and be able to change those as the conditions on the grid change. So that's, that block there is the power electronics. The output voltage here, which is connecting to the grid, is therefore a switched waveform. So it is not something you can directly connect to the grid. We have to filter it. And the LCL filter, which is shown here, is a low-pass filter that removes the frequencies associated with the high-frequency switching and leaves you with the low frequency voltage that you need. So in general, the output here should look something like a nice sine wave. Okay, um, so when we connect something to the grid, generally we want to control two things, the real power and the reactive power, at which point I might ask how many of you understand the concept of reactive power? Good, quite a few of you. Um, so we have real power, which is delivering energy, and we have reactive power, which is effectively delivering the energy that's stored in all the inductances and all the capacitances in the network. Okay? And reactive power is just energy that oscillates between a source and a load. So you give it some energy during the first half cycle, and you get it back during the second half cycle. The real power P is what is what you're delivering in terms of real energy and that's quite often where your revenue is raised it's on the delivery of energy 
So the input to our inverter is typically a DC voltage. Um, so from PV, you've got a DC output voltage from your PV system. You will have a maximum power point tracker, which will be managing the extraction of power from the PV system, making sure you're getting as much power and energy as you can as the conditions change in terms of irradiance and temperature and producing a constant DC voltage which is then input to the three phase DC to AC converter. So this VDC here is where you are taking power from your PV system. So which, whatever power you are delivering to the grid must also be power that's extracted in real time from your DC link. So if you extract, if you send more power to the grid, you have to be getting more power from your PV system. So the two P's have to be the same. There's no energy storage of any note within this system. The Q can be controlled independently of what's happening um, with regards to your irradiance on your PV system. Okay. So your aim is to extract as much power as you can from the PV system, deliver that to the grid, and then do whatever you need to do with the queue to meet your grid uh, compliance standards. Okay, so that's, that's what a standard three-phase inverter looks like. It's a set of six semiconductor switches with anti-parallel diodes. Um, once you've done a little bit of power electronics, this stuff kind of becomes obvious in terms of how it works. But essentially by pulse width modulating each of these bridge legs, so we have three bridge legs, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, by modulating these independently of one another, we can create an average voltage between the midpoint of one leg and the midpoint of the other leg. And that's the line voltage that you're applying to the, the, the filter. And by modulating each of the legs in a special way, we can generate a three-phase balanced set of voltages at the output once we've removed the harmonics associated with the high switching frequency. This is... Uh, some slide, some uh, still shots from a video we've recently made showing a couple of our PhD students disassembling an inverter for our advanced power electronics class. Um, so it's part of a, a, a suite of kind of multimedia educational films we've produced. And it, it's instructive because there's actually not a lot in there now. Um, maybe 10 years ago, this five kilowatt inverter would have weighed in excess of 35 kilograms. It would have a transformer in it. It would run very hot. Uh, these days, they're much lighter. There's no transformer. Uh, interestingly enough, you remove the transformer from an inverter and everything gets 2% more efficient. Um, so that's quite a step change in performance. Uh, and the transformer was removed about seven years ago um, in the academic community. So there's no transformer in here. The main switches are on the back of this printed circuit board and they clamp onto a heat sink which you might just be able to make out on the bottom of the box here. And this particular inverter probably costs $500. Okay, so the cost has come down, the mass has come down, the efficiency has gone up, um, so it's all being pushed in the right direction. Now, the thing that actually controls the whole system is this board here, which has a microcontroller, which is doing all the management of the PV inverter. It's generating the pulse width modulated signals. It's carrying out a control algorithm that's keeping the system safe and stable as best it can. And that's using a microcontroller now that costs about $10. Okay? So even in the microelectronics industry, the, the changes we've made in terms of how much we can package and the cost at which we can do it into D DSP devices has made all this stuff much more efficient and cheaper. <laughs>
The only thing that sits in the power path, with the exception of the inverter, is the LCL filter. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's becoming more efficient. Um, as we increase the switching frequency, we can shrink the filter that we need to use. That means it costs less, it's more efficient, um, and we can package it in a much smaller um, box. Now that LCL filter is important because it's removing the switching harmonics so that you may have a large number of harmonic voltages at the input because we're switching it on and off at a high frequency but the output here has to be sinusoidal with a very good power quality and with the switching frequencies we're using these days that quality of voltage at the output is very very good assuming we're controlling it correctly okay so that kind of briefly covers an inverter um, what are we trying to do? Well, the first thing we've got to do is synchronize the inverter with the grid before we effectively connect it to the grid. And that synchronization process is shown here in that at the beginning, the sine wave that the inverter is producing will not be synchronized to the grid. So its frequency might be different, its phase might be different, and its amplitude might be different. And through the process of synchronization, we take the inverter voltage here and we make it look like the grid. So it's the same voltage, the same frequency at the same phase. And then when we close the breaker, because the voltages on the two sides of the breaker are the same, there's no current flow. So we get a very safe uh, closure of the breaker, which is the thing that's going to connect the inverter to the grid. And there's an example video here. Um, if you look at the two sine waves, one of them is the grid, and the grid sine wave will not change um, as we run through this video. The other one is the inverter achieving synchronization. So it doesn't take long, and hopefully it'll work. Okay. And in true fashion, it doesn't. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that to the end when I get a chance to fix it. Okay, so the synchronization process takes the inverter voltage, looks at the grid voltage and synchronizes them so getting the same voltage, amplitude, the same frequency in the same phase, so those two sinusoids will line up. And then you can close the breaker and your inverter is then connected to the grid. And the thing that, the thing that actually controls the process of synchronization is the PLL, this box down here. And the phase lock loop is monitoring the grid voltage and working out what the amplitude is and what the phase of that grid voltage is. And it feeds it to the rest of the control system. So the phase lock loop is an important, essential part of the process. And if the phase lock loop decides that it's no longer locked to the grid voltage, it will disconnect the inverter. Um, so part of the issues that we're seeing with unusual behaviors are to do with how the phase lock loop is implemented. How do we control real power and reactive power once we are synchronized? Well, we have two, two vectors. We have the vector of the grid, which is V grid, and it's pointing horizontal. We use that as our reference. And then we also have the, um, the vector that's produced by the inverter, which is shown as V INV. So a very simplified circuit diagram of the system at 50 hertz is shown on the left. You have the voltage that's pr being produced by the inverter after the LC filter, and you have the voltage on the right-hand side, which is representing the grid, and you have some inductance between those two things. And it is important that we have some inductance because that allows us to regulate the current. Um, so in a very simplified 
way we've got the phasor diagram on the right by changing the magnitude and the phase of the inverter voltage we can change the magnitude and the phase of the current that flows between the inverter and the grid and that's shown as I grid down here so if we made the grid the inverter voltage slightly bigger then what we'd find is the current increases and if we shift the voltage vector that the inverter is producing so if we moved it in a anti-clockwise direction relative to the grid voltage then we would also change the angle of the current relative to the grid voltage and for those of you who know about real and reactive power the real power delivered to the grid is the component of the inverter current that is in phase with the grid voltage and the reactive power is delivered by the current that is out of phase and out of phase by 90 degrees to the grid voltage so being able to control the magnitude and the phase of the current gives you control over real and reactive power and you have independent control of those two things so you can independently regulate Q and keep P the same or vice versa or you can change them both um, as, an, as you want at will okay so in a standard grid tie inverter we are trying to regulate P and Q um, to do that we regulate the current and we regulate the current by adjusting the voltage that the inverter produces so we have a set of nested control loops the inner control loop is regulating the current and the outer control loop is regulating the P and the Q by using the current controllers so it's a standard nested negative feedback control loop so the current controller is typically much faster than the bandwidth we need for control of P and Q okay and it's important that we don't change P and Q very quickly because if we change P or Q faster than the period of our main cycle we are actually causing harmonic distortion in the power that we're delivering to the grid so we, we can't let P and Q change as quickly as we might want to because there is then the, the possibility of during steady state operation we're actually introducing more harmonics than we're allowed to so we have to slow some of the control loops down the other slightly negative part of inverter connected generation is that our currents are limited by the capability of our power semiconductors so typically in a economic version of an inverter you might get two per unit current out um, and still be within the junction temperature limitation of your semiconductor device so the more current you have the bigger the losses in the switches the hotter they get and generally that means that your capability of delivering current into a fault is maybe twice its rated value and that is in comparison to a standard electrical generator which under fault conditions can deliver eight or ten times per unit current and the consequence of that is that the protection systems in our existing grid rely on having very high fault currents to trip the protection and if we're then exchanging electrical generators with inverters our ability to deliver fault current is much reduced okay so that's another challenge that we are beginning to have to deal with okay so that's a little bit of an overview um, what have we been doing well we've been benchmarking a set of inverters we've now tested 22 commercial off-the-shelf inverters rated around about the 5 kVA mark so pretty standard in terms of what's installed within the network with residential solar systems we put the inverter in a test rig the test rig uses a photovoltaic emulator which feeds the DC link 
So it's just emulating the PV array. And then we attach the AC output of the inverter to a grid emulator, which is something that emulates the grid. And using that grid emulator, we can expose the inverter to disturbances on the grid. So we can change the voltage, we can change the frequency, we can introduce phase angle jumps. So we can do all the things we should never do with the grid in the lab. Yeah. And between the grid emulator and the inverter, there's a standard um, inductance, which represents the impedance that you always have between your inverter and the thing that represents the grid. And basically what we do is we, we get the inverter we want to test, and we run through something like 50 different tests that typically takes two to three days of doing the tests and gathering the data and then maybe takes us a week to process that data and generate a report. So what have we found? Well, there are three, three issues we've come across um, where we've seen unusual behaviors in response to particular types of grid disturbances. One of those is disturbances where you see a very rapid change in voltage for a short duration. Uh, and that's indicative of what happens when you switch transmission lines in and out of, of, of a parallel configuration when you see a particular fault in the transmission network it will typically be cleared in around five cycles. So what we've been doing is we've been applying in one of our tests a fast voltage sag which dips the voltage down by 80% for 100 milliseconds and we look at what happens to the output of the inverter and see if that's something that's a good response or if it's a unexpected response. We also do a phase angle jump which is essentially taking the sine wave voltage and at some point in the cycle jumping it forward instantaneously or jumping it backwards instantaneously. When does that happen? Well, that happens when we get an asymmetric fault on the network because we move from a system where we have a balanced set of voltages to a system where we have an unbalanced set of voltages. And that happens as soon as the voltage drop occurs. So the instant the voltage drop occurs, we immediately introduce within our network a negative sequence voltage, which is the same as making the voltage jump in phase. So these phase angle jumps do occur, and they do occur quite regularly. The other thing that we found uh, in one instance, so there's only one inverter that's really vulnerable to this, and that's a rate of change of frequency. And you get a rate of change of frequency in the network when supply and demand don't match. And the bigger the difference between supply and demand, the faster the frequency will change. Um, so we apply rates of change of frequency to these inverters of 1 hertz per second, 4 hertz per second, and 10 hertz per second. Now, 1, one hertz per second is not unusual in the grid. 4 hertz per second would be an extreme case. 10 hertz per second is South Australia blacking out. Um, that's how quickly the, the frequency changes uh, when, you, when you're in an extreme disturbance like uh, happened in South Australia. So, I'll summarize it first and then we can look at some traces. The inverter connection due to disconnection or curtailment due to fast voltage sags, um, approximately half the inverters we have tested will either curtail or disconnect on a fast voltage sag test. Okay, that's half, half of the inverters that we've tested. And we reckon we've probably tested most of the good ones. Okay. That represents 140 megawatts. That's what we know. So we've tested 22 inverters. Those 22 inverters maybe represent 20% of the total connected fleet of inverters. So there's another 80% where they may not disconnect, they may all disconnect, or we may extrapolate what we've got from our 22 tests and come up with a figure that, that gives us a, a justifiable figure for what's connected to the NEM and what's uh, 
um, vulnerable to this type of fault or this type of voltage disturbance. Second key point, phase angle jumps. We've only got four out of the 22 inverters that will continue to function or ride through a phase angle jump up to 90 degrees. So only four out of 22 will do that. So that said, 90 degrees is quite extreme. Um, in the recent revision of the IEEE standard, they introduced a test up to 60 degrees. So we've tested our inverters at 15, 30, 45, and 90. We've missed out 60. Don't ask why. Key point three, um, rock off. There is one inverter that is very sensitive to rates of change of frequency. Um, that's, that's quite good, other than the fact there's 240 megawatts of that inverter connected to the NEM. And if you're really, really interested in having a look at some more traces after I've spent the next 10 minutes looking at some traces, there's a link down there where we have a database and a viewer where you can look at these disturbances and these test results. Um, and you can look at them in quite fine detail if you can wait for all the information to download. Each inverter test generates about five gigs of, of data. Um, so it's, there's also a data management issue with what we're doing. Okay, so part of what we're doing is try to, trying to inform how we need to change the standard 4777 um, that was revised in 2015. When you read through it, you suddenly realize uh, there's a whole load of ambiguity in there. And one of the, one of the ones we picked out here is the reaction, the protective reaction of the inverter system to a low voltage. So if the voltage dips <coughs> below 180 volts, and if it dips for more than one second, then <coughs> it, the inverter should disconnect. And it should disconnect within two seconds of the event occurring. What it doesn't tell you is what it should do if after a second the under voltage has disappeared. And that's one of the ambiguities we found when we started looking at fast voltage sags. So we were applying a voltage sag for 100 milliseconds well below 180 volts, and we're thinking, well, what does the standard actually say should happen under those circumstances? And it doesn't. It's vague. It's amb ambiguous. So part of the revision is taking these um, vague and ambiguous test cases and making them detailed and deterministic. So here's a fast voltage sag. Um, we've got three traces. The top trace is what's happening at the AC terminal of the inverter where it's connected to the grid emulator. So if it's all working correctly, the voltage, which is the blue trace, you should not be able to see because it should be hide, hidden by the red trace, which is the current that the inverter is injecting. So under normal operation, your Real power is whatever it is, one per unit, and your reactive power should be zero. So you shouldn't see any phase displacement between the sine wave that's representing the voltage and the sine wave that's rep representing the current. So before the event occurs, this inverter is working really well. It's delivering unity power factor power to the grid of one per unit. The trace in the middle is showing what we're extracting from the PV emulator. Um, it's all be normalized to one per unit. That's why everything's a nice, nice number. That's why the voltages lie on top of the currents. Um, and as you can see, before the, the disturbance occurs, the, the, the DC voltage and current is constant. And from that, the real and reactive power, PG and QG, which is shown in the bottom trace, they are stable. The Q is zero and the P is one per unit, okay? Now, we apply a sag, a fast voltage sag, so the blue, the blue sine wave in the top trace suddenly reduces, and we see a reaction from the inverter. So the, the DC power goes down, 
the DC voltage that we extract from the PV emulator rises because we're taking less current out, so we're moving down the VI graph of the PV array, heading towards the open circuit voltage. The AC current that is being delivered to the grid is ramping down, it's still sinusoidal, it's still under control, yep, so it's behaving itself. And then when the sag disappears, after 100 milliseconds, it returns back to its normal operation. So we'd say that the inverter is riding through that voltage sag and it recovers and it continues in the same condition it was before the sag occurs. This is what happens with another inverter which will have a different control system. The sag occurs here at 3.4 seconds. Up until that point it's functioning beautifully. The voltage and the current are in phase. It's taking the maximum power from the PV array and it's delivering um, zero Q to the grid and whatever real power it is generating and extracting from the PV emulator. Then what happens? Well, we get the voltage sag, so the voltage drops. The first reaction is that the current increases and that can be viewed as being sensible because it's still trying to deliver the maximum power that it can generate into the grid. The voltage is dropped, so the current has to rise, so that you can, you can justify that behavior. And then once the voltage recovers at 3.5 seconds, everything goes to pot. Okay, the, the current is no longer under control, so we're delivering a P and a Q which is varying very quickly. Um, the maximum power point tracker has no idea what it's doing, so the, the DC voltage and current we're taking from the emulator is not stable and if we look at the real and reactive power on the bottom graph again it's, it's showing a lot of oscillation and you don't really want that type of inverter continuing to do that on your network for any significant amount of time and fortunately for us that inverter decides it's in trouble so it reduces the power it regains control and then it, it will recover, but it will recover at what's known as a six minute rate. So it will return back to its original power point in six minutes time. Okay, so for all intensive purposes, for at least one minute, you've lost every inverter of that make and model. Yeah, so it's, it's effectively a, a large scale disconnection. Here's another example. Um, a little bit more controlled in terms of what it does during the sag and the recovery but the the net result is that after the voltage sag this inverter maker model is also effectively delivering no power to the network so you're going from one per unit to zero per unit because of the fast voltage sag and its effect on the control system and it takes six minutes to recover and that's that's the standard the standard says on disconnection You've got to wait one minute, you've got to try and reconnect. If you do reconnect, you then ramp up your power at the six minute rate. So to summarize all of that, of the 22 inverters we've connected, to jump to the figure that's really of note, then we found that within the NEM, there's about 140 megawatts of known vulnerability to fast voltage sags. That in itself is not a big number. Yeah, when you compare it to the peak demand, which is 35 gigawatts. Okay, but we'll see why it does become important in a moment. The next set of tests is phase voltage jumps. So using our grid emulator, we can step the voltage forward or back by whatever phase we want. Um, so we've chosen 15, 30, 45 and 90 degrees. Here's an example of a phase jump of 15 degrees and a inverter quite happily riding through that. It's almost impossible to discern the actual phase angle jump, but the keen-eyed amongst you might see that there's a tiny little blip on the top of that sine wave, and that's a phase angle jump of 15 degrees. It's really benign, you, you know, it's, it's diffi difficult to even see it on the trace, uh, even under lab um, 
under the scenarios we can do in the lab. This is the same inverter now with a 30 degree phase angle jump. And the key point here is that within 100 milliseconds, So within a cycle and a half, the inverter has been looking at the voltage uh, on the grid and it has interpreted the phase angle jump as a big frequency issue on the grid and is disconnected because it actually thinks the frequency is increased to beyond what it should be working at. So it's disconnected. And again, it takes six minutes to come back up. Uh, this is an example of an inverter that curtails, so it doesn't disconnect on a phase angle jump, it decides there's a problem and reduces its power. So in some respects it's slightly better than disconnecting because it can at least continue to deliver some energy to the grid, um, but it is reduced. So we're getting some unusual behaviours. We've got some inverters that are riding through, we've got some inverters that are disconnecting, and we've got some that are curtailing. Then we summarise that and the inverters with the nice green lines are the good ones that are capable of riding through any phase angle jump and the rest are doing something unusual. Some of them are disconnecting on 30 degrees, some of them are curtailing, sometimes some inverters need a 40, 45 degree phase jump to make them do something unusual. But that's quite an interesting result and we'll see how that scales into the NEM. Um, so if we draw a table that sums up all these um, vulnerabilities, then the vulnerability to 45 degree phase jumps is about 180 megawatts. Again, not a really big number, um, unless it's all in, a, in South Australia, which it won't be, it'll be distributed, but we'll look at how that might scale up to the grid. Finally, rate of change of frequency. Each of the 22 inverters have been exposed to 1 hertz per second, 4 hertz per second, and 10 hertz per second. Um, I think nearly all of them stay online even with a 10 hertz per second rate of change of frequency, which is really good performance. Um, but there is one inverter, which is shown here, that disconnects even on 1 hertz per second. Um, so the grid emulator frequency 3.35 seconds and it's increasing at a 1 hertz per second rate and then within less than a second the inverter decides that the rate of change of frequency is too high and disconnects okay and this inverter the, there is 250 about 250 megawatts installed on the NEM Okay, so jumping, given time. If we take these inverter results, there are, three, there are three ways we can extrapolate. One is we can say that the thing that we can only be certain of is that the ones we've tested and their popularity in the grid gives us a number, and that number tends to be somewhere between 150 megawatts and 300 megawatts of vulnerability to any one of these three types of disturbances. The glass half empty and the glass half full, and you decide which one is which, you could say that for the rest of the fleet of inverter types that we have in the network, if they display the same distribution of sensitivity as the 22 that we've tested, we'll get a number which is shown here on the right hand side. So when we scale it, what we find is the vulnerability of the network to each of these three faults is now scaling into the one to two gigawatt range. And that's a contingency, a credible contingency that is not accounted for in the network. Usually network operators are basing their credible contingencies on either a loss of a major transmission pathway or the loss of a large generator, which is usually somewhere between 700 megawatts and a gigawatt. But we have inverters, potentially we have inverters where 
with a particular type of grid disturbance, we could be tripping off almost two gigawatts of inverted generated power. And that does represent an issue for the market, the, the market operator who is supposed to be managing the technical st stability of the network. And that's why AEMO are becoming very interested in the behaviours of inverters and inverter control systems to things that are happening on the network which are relatively benign. Okay, so we are continuing to work through the list of inverters from the most popular to the least popular. We'll never get down to the bottom because there's something like 10,000 different makes and models of inverters connected to the Australian grid. And what we're hoping to achieve is get to the point where we have tested around about 40% of the equivalent connected generation. Um, and we're feeding these details back to AEMO and to our partners, Electronet and TAS Networks, because they have their own issues in South Australia and in Tasmania with having higher and higher penetrations of inverter connected generation, which is not necessarily a bad thing, as long as you're controlling your inverters in a way that is commensurate with how you need to operate a network. And because of these test results, we have now got ourselves roped into trying to fix AS4777, um, which is turning into a bit of a bun fight. Um, even working out what the scope of 4777 is now very difficult because we have single phase and three phase inverters. We have hybrid inverters where we've got energy storage connected to them. Some people are now saying, well, we should also be considering electric vehicles. So we've gone from a relatively small and compact standard to something that's just exploding. Okay, any questions? Thank you, John. That was very interesting. Um, so you mentioned there were three main issues that was looked at. The voltage start, voltage drop, um, the phase angle difference, and also the uh, frequency change and how emergers behave. So are these the main three issues that could rise in, the, in our network NEM? Have you also looked into perhaps voltage rise as well and how um, emergers react to that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we've, the, the three things we've found vulnerabilities to so far are fast voltage sags, phase angle jumps, and rate of change of frequency. If we park rate of change of frequency to one side, because that's actually quite a, a special type of fault, that we're only seeing in one inverter. It turns out that, you, you know, your question about rise and fall, the, the concept of frequency and phase during a cycle, when you see a change in voltage or a change in phase, uh, becomes difficult to define, which is a very technical way of saying a voltage rise and a voltage fall represent a similar set of circumstances to the inverter control unit. So when you, when you drop the voltage quickly, you are also changing the phase and changing the frequency for that cycle. And likewise, when you increase the voltage, you're, you're also doing something to that cycle. So the vulnerability to voltage drop and voltage rise is going to be the same. Yeah. Thank you. Seeing that we have class uh, waiting, so maybe yeah. first first let's thank John and John maybe will wait a bit outside so urgent question but I promise that I will force John to come again <laughs> so let's thank John again okay thank you too.